We are going to talk about this week why I am a Lutheran. Many of you know I am a Lutheran, and I'm going to give you some reasons why. And one very good reason why I am a Lutheran is because we believe in God. We're going to explore that very simple concept, but sometimes elusive concept to others on this week's podcast. This is Matthew Garnett. Welcome to In Layman's Terms. Perhaps it is our genetic inheritance that explains why those of us with no allegiance to a holy book or a pope or an ayatollah to tell us what is good still manage to ground ourselves in a moral consensus which is surprisingly widely agreed. Okay, so we're going to talk about God this week. And um, this is kind of in conjunction with the project I'm working on right now. It's it's review for those of you loyal listeners who have listened to the podcast over the past year or so where we've talked about the necessity of having God's voice and why we need an outside authority uh, to reveal to us uh, things like morality and so forth. That's what we're going to talk about this week and I'm really going to lay out my entire argument on that. Um, And while it might be review for some of you, it's good review. And for those who haven't heard my arguments on this, um, here, here, here we go. But before we get to all that, first of all, let me welcome all of you who are listening on KNNA The Cross in Nebraska. Uh, thank you to Pastor Poppy and everyone up there in, in Nebraska on KNNA for uh, for broadcasting us and welcome aboard. Also, thank you to um, my friend Steve Kozar. I sometimes forget to do this. When, every time we uh, kind of get syndicated, I guess, I it's just habit, really, to, think and uh and announce all these things but steve kozar has us on um the the messed up church.com there's wonderful resources there we're all kind of pooling our efforts uh to get more uh c- good content to you all in, in um uh, in the sense of you know how to evaluate this whole american uh, religious landscape so we are on the messed up church dot com uh, we often post the podcast there. You can listen to them for free there. And we want to thank uh, the Messed Up Church for, for having us aboard there. Also, um, we want to remind you, as we always do, that we are trying to drill a well for a Christian school in Kenya. And we need you to donate. And so if you go to my website, laymanstermsradio.org, the first thing you'll hit is a splash page which asks you to donate per podcast. Now, I think this is a fairly brilliant idea. Actually, I stole this from Sam Harris, believe it or not. Um, he's uh, he, he hasn't monetized his podcast in a way where you have to you have to pay to to get beyond a paywall to listen to his podcast. But what what he's done is he set up a situation where uh, the first thing you do is you you can donate or not donate to his already fairly well endowed bank account. We are not trying to endow our bank accounts here. We're trying to raise money to drill a well for children who, as a part of their school curriculum, have to go to local streams and rivers some days to get water. And so we have a $5, 10 and $15 donation per podcast. And so if you're listening to this right now and you haven't paid your $5, 10 or $15 for the podcast, you should do that. You, you, you should pony up. Uh, five bucks a podcast is not asking that much. Um, or if you want to donate um, a one-time donation, we also have a GoFundMe set up. Donate $50 there. And if we had everybody do this, we could very easily raise the money required to drill this well. So there's no reason for it. We should be able to get this done. We are creeping toward it. Um, creeping being the operative word there. Uh, but, but it should not be this way. So I, I would continue to ask you and encourage you gently although urgently to donate to the Kenya Well Project for Kibos Hope Academy laymanstermsradio.org just go to the splash page there it's very easy hit a PayPal button a couple clicks later you've donated five bucks and if we can get 
all the listeners we have for one podcast to donate five dollars. That's it. For, you know, forget about the people who are going to donate ten or fifteen. Um, if we can have everyone who listens donate the five dollars, we're going to take a big chunk out of this week by week, and we could have this done very easily in a very short period of time. So please go donate to the Kenya Well Project um, at at our website. All right, so. I'm a Lutheran, and here's one reason I'm a Lutheran. The first article of the Augsburg Confession. This is the, the Augsburg Confession are the confessions of faith that all of our pastors are required to sign off on, and any good Lutheran would sign off on and say, yes, we believe these are true. But here's the first article of it. People ask me, why am I, why am I a Lutheran? Well, I'd have to walk you through the Augsburg Confession to tell you why I'm a Lutheran. Because as many of you know who are loyal listeners, I've been I've you know, I've got a PhD in the school of hard knocks. Let's just put it that way. I've I've tried everything else out there that there is to try in the way of religion. And when I happened upon the Lutheran faith and I started to study the confessions of the Lutheran faith, this all started to come together. And it starts right here with this article. And it's called Of God, very simply. The reason I'm a Lutheran is this. Our churches, with common consent, do teach that the decree of the Council of Nicaea concerning the unity of the divine essence and concerning the three persons is true and to be believed without any doubting. That is to say that there is one divine essence which is called and which is God. Eternal, without body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. The maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible. And yet there are three persons of the same essence and power who are also co-eternal, the Father, the Son, and the Holy, the Holy Ghost. And the term person they use as the fathers have used it to signify not a part or a quality in another, but that which subsists of itself. So that is one reason why I'm a Lutheran. Particularly pay attention to these lines. There is one divine essence, which is called God, eternal, without body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things visible and invisible. That's what we're going to tackle this week and talk about what the other options are out there. Particularly the other options being not believing that there is a divine essence, that there is a God. That's what we're going to talk about this week. And, and we're, we're going to particularly talk about it in the sense that it's, a completely, it's completely incoherent. It does, it, it, not only is it incoherent, it doesn't, um, it doesn't work practically. Even you pragmatists out there will appreciate this. We're going to talk about what it means just cognitively to think about life without God. That's what we're talking about this week and what the implications of that are. And what astounded me, what astonished me about this first article in the Augsburg Confession is that this answered so many questions for me. This resonated with me. Because this, these are the questions I had. These were the problems I, were having, I, I was having with trying to figure things out when it came to life and meaning and God and these sorts of things. This article right here sorts all of that out. And I've got to be honest with you. It's, it's one of the big reasons why I'm a Lutheran. Because of what this says right here. It it. it it melted away all kinds of confusion that I'd put myself through in the past. And so hopefully it will do the same for you. 
hopefully it will, if you are having these kinds of questions, it'll make sense of it. Because um, I think, here, here's the thing, um, in, in our modern day and age, we think we've accomplished so much. I mean, because we're so economically wealthy and we have longer lifespans and et cetera, we, we tend to think that because of those things, because we have the creature comforts really, really readily at our fingertips, that we have that we somehow outclass every other human being who has ever lived, and I just don't think that's true. I think that these men, and really, the entire witness of Holy Scripture has had this for millennia. I mean, I don't that it it. it that's essentially the essence of the genetic fallacy is we're smarter than people who came before us. Now we have made, we may have made more discoveries and we may know more about science. We may have things better economically and you know, we may have more access, as, as I said, to the creature comforts. That's absolutely true, but that doesn't mean that they, that we are smarter than they were when it comes to these things. It, do, it doesn't mean that. And, and, just, and when I look back and I dig back deeper and deeper into the past, what I find is a wisdom that we are lacking in this day and time. And the Augsburg Confession first article nails something that we are lacking in this day and time. And in fact, not only lacking, but think we can do without. And my intent in this, in this, uh, in this broadcast is to, is to demonstrate to you that um, what these men saw when the Augsburg Confession was, was, was written in 1529 and millennia before that, centuries before that, that this notion of a divine essence was something that they, they recognized, that, the, that it was just obvious to them. And now we think we're so, we think we've progressed so much. We think we have all these things, and again, I think it's mostly because we live such economically uh, comfortable lives, and that we we live longer than these people did. We think we're so so much smarter than they were when it comes to these sorts of things. And the reality is, we're not. In fact, we've become more uh, stupid, perhaps, when it comes to these things. Because they realized that this this was just a given. They, the, uh, there's does God exist? Um, uh, who would deny such a thing, right? So so there's you won't see a lot of arguments about how you know the, you've got an atheist on one side debating Martin Luther. There's just doesn't exist because it was just so patently obvious, not only theologically but philosophically that God must necessarily exist. That they, you know, they in some ways just passed over it in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, everybody agrees God exists. But what what's insightful about this article is that it brings forth the arguments we need in this day and time to combat those who would say that God does not exist. In fact, that we do not need God. We don't need God's voice. And this article, especially in the, you know, uh, eternal, without body, without parts, infinite power, wisdom, goodness, and the maker and preserver of all things, that is in sight right there, written now over 500 years ago. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, but it, 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 I mean, it's interesting in one sense that they, they, had the foresight to see that at some point somebody might deny God and his nature. Uh, but they're taking this straight from Holy Scripture. Okay, And that's what we're going to talk about today. The case for God. And we're going to lay it out. And we're going to juxtapose ourselves against the usual suspects. And so here we go with, uh, with our buddy Richard Dawkins. Enjoy. Perhaps it is our genetic inheritance that explains why those of us with no allegiance to a holy book or a pope or an ayatollah to tell us what is good still manage to ground ourselves in a moral consensus which is surprisingly widely agreed.
As social animals, we've worked out that we wouldn't want to live in a society where it was acceptable to rape, murder or steal. We have a moral conscience and a mutual empathy, and it is constantly evolving. Religious or not, we have changed in unison and continue to change in our attitude to what is right and what is wrong. Fifty years ago, just about everybody in Britain was somewhat racist. Now, only a few people are. Fifty years ago, it was impossible for gay people to walk along the street hand in hand. Now, it's easy. Some of us lag behind the advancing wave of moral standards, and some of us are ahead. But all of us in the 21st century are ahead of our counterparts from the time of Abraham, Mohammed, or St. Paul. The progressive shift often emerges in opposition to religion. It's driven by improved education and then expressed by newspaper editorials, television soap operas, parliamentary speeches, judicial rulings, and novels. I guess my starting point would be the brain is responsible for consciousness. And we could be reasonably sure that when that brain ceases to be, when it falls apart and decomposes, that'll be the end of us. From that, quite a lot of things follow, I think, especially morally. We are the very privileged owners of a brief spark of consciousness. And we therefore have to take responsibility for it. You cannot rely, as Christians or uh, Muslims do, on a world elsewhere, a paradise to which one can work towards and maybe make sacrifices, and crucially make sacrifices of other people. We have a marvellous gift, and you see it develop in children, this ability to become aware that other people have minds just like your own, and feelings that are just as important as your own. And this gift of empathy seems to me to be the building block of, of our moral system. I profoundly agree with you, and I've always felt but one of the things that's wrong with religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with mm. answers which are not really answers at all. And if you have a sacred text that tells you how the world began or what the relationship is between this sky god and you, uh, it does curtail your curiosity. It cuts off a source of wonder. The loveliness of the world in, in, in its wondrousness is not apparent to me in Islam or Christianity and all the other uh, major religions. That's really interesting because the uh, Dawkins guest on, uh, on this documentary asserts that it cuts off your curiosity. Since I've been a Christian, a Lutheran, uh, my curiosity is is boundless and I'm Welcome to explore anything. So there's just a little note on that. Let me also hasten to add that, but for Richard Dawkins and his book, God Delusion, I probably would be an atheist. That's what I was considering probably about 10 years ago. And you, some of you may have heard me tell this story about the God Delusion. Essentially, when I read God Delusion, my immediate take on it was this is simply another form of fundamentalism. You heard Dawkins talk about how in Britain uh, that racism is starting to be extricated. And that's good and that's biblical. Finally figured that out. Should have figured that out a long time ago. But that a gay couple can walk hand in hand down the street without worrying about being chastised. Now, I don't think that people should be verbally abused or anything. I mean, people who are gay, if they're walking down the street hand in hand, the last thing I would encourage anybody to do who disagrees with that lifestyle is to start yelling at them. Or giving them dirty looks or, or anything else. That's not the move there. But here's the thing with just that, that little issue. Is 
because those who have who have disagreed, and it's not just Christians, mind you, that have disagreed with that lifestyle. It's a number of other people. But just because the way people have disagreed with that lifestyle, um, and it's and it's been not only not, not just distasteful but cruel and and ugly. Because that's how it's been dealt with in the past. Therefore, the response is we swing to the other pendulum move and say, well, because those people have been dealt with in an, in an ugly manner in the past, that therefore now we have to accept their lifestyle. That that is completely illogical. That's that's a pendulum swing from 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 treating people hatefully who are who are behaving in a way that we disagree with all the way to now what the response needs to be is we accept how they behave that's that's not the answer the answer is to to address the behavior in a kind and compassionate way and so the problem there becomes, so Dawkins is just talking about how great it is that um, those who are engaged in homosexual lifestyles can, can do this openly and that we should embrace it. Who is Richard Dawkins to tell me what my moral standards should be? Who is the larger society? If the, if the entire... Con uh, consensus of the human race came together and said we should kill babies before they're born would that still make it right see why should I adopt Richard Dawkins as my new god that was my problem with god delusion and believe me when I tell you I was I'm like okay I'm going to be an atheist and let's let's do this thing Need to read God Delusion. That was what my, one of my atheist friends told me. Hey, I, I think I, I think I want to go down this atheist path. What should I do first? Read God Delusion. And when I read that, I'm, I, <laughs> the only thing I saw was I'm adopting Richard Dawkins as my new God. He's going to tell me what's right and wrong and how to proceed through life. And I found and did find in my circumstances or this is when I when I was out at the Claremont School of Theology I found in my circumstances there that the fundamentalism strictly defined formally defined was more rampant than any fundamentalism I'd ever encountered in Christianity you tell me that being gay or being sexually libertine is wrong well, you're outcast. You tell me that A, B, and C issue isn't something you embrace and endorse? You're outcast. You had to toe the line more strictly in that setting than any fundamentalist setting I've ever been a part of. And the backlash, the hostility, when you didn't tell that... Now, this is back in... 2006, 2007, 2008. This is before all the Trump brouhaha. See. So. Atheism, especially as articulated by a man like Dawkins, Harris, etc. Is, is another version of fundamentalism. It, re it really is. Because if you don't adhere to. If I don't think it's okay. For men to be involved in homosexual relationships, you're outside the pale. You've missed the boat. You're not adhering to the orthodoxy of the consensus. And again, the question comes, who is Dawkins? Who is the consensus to tell me what's right and wrong? In Nazi Germany, the consensus was we should kill mental, mentally retarded people. We should kill Jews. We should kill handicapped people because we want to advance the master race. That was the consensus. And 
if you noticed in this clip, that's exactly what Dawkins is putting forth, is a consensus morality. And it's astonishing to me that 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 he talked about this this whole um, you know how how we have kind of come together and we have these remarkably similar types of uh, of morals. Well, okay, so what? That's consensus morality. And according to Dawkins, if you question that, especially from a uh, Christian worldview then you're 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 outside you're outcast and that's a problem that's a major problem because when we can't challenge the consensus that's when stuff like holocaust happen that's when stuff like gulags occur see we need an authority that's greater than richard dawkins and the consensus right that's the idea now what kind of authority do we need do we need zeus thor the flying spaghetti monster i don't think so bobby henderson wrote an open letter to the kansas city school board which i am going to redo here which i have I have a copy of the actual letter. Now, I'm going to read most of it, not all of it. Normally, I don't read word for word. But this is amazing. And this is what spawned the flying spaghetti monster. It says, I am writing you with much concern after having read of your hearing to decide whether the alternative theory of intelligent design should be taught along with the theory of evolution. I think we can all agree that it is important for students to hear multiple viewpoints so they can choose for themselves the theory that makes the most sense to them. I am concerned that students will only hear one theory of intelligent design. Let us remember that there are multiple theories of intelligent design. I and many others around the world are in the strong belief that the universe was created by a flying spaghetti monster. It is he who created all that we see and that we feel. We feel strongly that the overwhelming scientific evidence point towards evolutionary processes is we nothing completely but a coincidence. Today. We would never dream of behaving that way. Him. It is for this reason that I'm writing you today to formally request that this alternative theory be taught in your schools along with the other two theories. In fact, I will go as far to say, if you do not agree to do this, we will be forced to proceed with legal action. I'm sure you see where we are coming from. If the intelligent design theory is not based on faith, but instead another scientific theory as it is claimed, then you must also allow our theory to be taught, as it is also based on science and not faith. Some find that hard to believe, so it may be helpful to tell you a little bit about, more about our beliefs. We have evidence that a flying spaghetti monster created the universe. None of us, of course, were around to see it, but we have written accounts of it. We have several lengthy volumes explaining the details of his power. Also, you may be surprised to hear that there are over 10 million of us, and growing. We tend to be very secretive, as many people claim our beliefs are not substantiated by observable evidence. Then he goes on to talk about carbon dating and how you may get test results, but that's the flying spaghetti monster messing with those data every time to fool scientists. Then he continues, I am sure you now realize how important it is that your students are taught this alternative theory. It is absolutely imperative that you realize the observable evidence is a distraction of the flying spaghetti monster. Furthermore, it is disrespectful to teach our beliefs without wearing his chosen outfit. Now, I did have a pirate outfit I was planning to put on today, but we have a photographer for the New York Times, and I knew if I dressed up in a damn pirate outfit, that's the picture he would choose. So it's <laughs> so I am committing blasphemy to you because of the press, I will admit. I'm guilty. I did not dress in my pirate regalia. I, I apologize. <laughs> Blame the New York Times, which is, of course, full pirate regalia. I cannot stress the importance of this enough, and unfortunately cannot describe in detail why this must be done, as I fear this letter is already becoming too long. The concise explanation is that he becomes angry if we don't. You may be interested to know that global warming, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other natural disasters are a direct effect of the shrinking number of pirates since the 1800s. <laughs> For your interest, I have included a graph approximately with the number of pirates versus the average global warming over the last 200 years. As you can see, there is a statistically significant increase in relation between pirates and global temperature. This is the exact graph that was included with this letter. 
<laughs> I can't make this shit up. <laughs> in conclusion, thank you for taking this time to hear our views and beliefs. I hope I was able to convey the importance of teaching this theory to your students. We will, of course, be able to train the, teach the teachers in this alternate theory. I am eagerly awaiting your response and hope dearly that no legal action will need to be taken. I think we can also look forward to the time when these three theories are given the equal time in our science classrooms across the country and eventually the world. One third time for intelligent design, one third time for flying spaghetti monster pastafarianism, and one third time for logical conjecture based on overwhelming evidence evolution. Sincerely yours, Bobby Henderson, Concerned Citizen. P.S. I have also concluded an artistic drawing of him creating a mountain, a tree, and a midget. <laughs> Remember, we are all his creations. All right. That was pretty funny. Um, clever, I guess, but fairly shallow philosophically. And this, this is the problem with Dawkins and all the new atheists, is that they might be decent scientists in their own respect, but they're not very good philosophers. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Let's go back to AC1, Augsburg Confession 1. There's one divine essence, which is called God, eternal, without body, without parts, infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things. Now, we call that that is the very definition of God. And that's why AC1 is so brilliant. It defines God as the singular thing that could have created all things. It can't. If the spaghetti, if the flying spaghetti monster is eternal, without body, without parts, and in infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker of all things, maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible, then fine. You can call it the flying spaghetti monster if you want. That's okay, I guess. It's kind of crass, I suppose. But throughout philosophical history, this being has been called God. And this is why the whole notion of the flying spaghetti monster won't do. Um, Michael Shermer likes to talk about how, oh, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in Thor. We don't believe in Odin. We don't believe in Zeus. We just go one God further. Well, Zeus, Odin, Thor, these gods are not the kinds of gods that we would talk about that would bring the universe into being. There's only one God. That was what monotheism was all about was essentially Aristotle's unmoved mover. This is something atheists don't like to talk about. If you want to win a, win a debate with one of your atheist friends, bring up the unmoved mover. What about Aristotle's unmoved mover? What do you think about that? See what they say. I've been astonished at, at the conversations that have ensued from that very question. What about Aristotle's un, unmoved mover? Aristotle wasn't an idiot. Maybe I'll start with that question. Was, was Aristotle an idiot? No, of course not. He was one of the most brilliant philosophers of human history. Okay, what about his notion of the unmoved mover? What do you, what do, you do with that? And a lot of times there's just simply not an answer. Um, the way I explain this to, to the teenagers in my Bible class so I talk about my coffee cup on a, on a table and what's, what's holding up that coffee cup. What, what's causing the coffee cup to, to sit there? Well, it's, it's the table. It's the floor. It's the foundation of the building. It's the earth. And you keep going back until, until what? The table the floor, the foundation, the earth. What's holding up the coffee cup? The table. What's holding up the table? The floor. What's holding up the floor? The foundation. What's holding up the foundation? The earth. What's holding up the earth? The laws of physics. 
what's holding up the laws of physics and an infinite regress is completely senseless, senseless when you look at what modern science has brought to us. To say that there can't be an infinite, infinite recess. That the, that, the, that the universe is not infinite. That there was a beginning point to the universe. Now, whether you call that Big Bang or whatever else, there was a beginning point. And what upheld that beginning point? It's incoherent. So, take the beginning of the universe and compare it to the coffee cup. We would never explain the coffee cup as, well, it's just it's just there. It just, just sits there. There's no explanation for it. But yet, that's how we want to explain the beginnings of the universe. It doesn't work, does it? And this is essentially the, the Aristotelian argument. That there had to be an unmoved mover. And, the, and, the, and this unmoved mover had to be a complete being. Someone who is eternal, without body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. The maker and preserver of all things. We call God omniscient, all-knowing. Omnipresent, all present, all uh, omni uh, omnipotent, all powerful. All things that the first article of our of the Lutheran Confessions say. God has to be. God has to be the unmoved mover. Because if if, if there's something that can be added to God. If he's not all-knowing, if he's not all-present, if he's not all-powerful and loving and good, then something can then you've got something that can be added to. And you have to go back further and find out, okay, well, what's adding to this being? That's why the whole notion of who created God is completely incoherent. Because at some point, you have to stop the infinite regress simply based on science. You want to talk about science? The universe had a beginning. And if it had a beginning, it had to have a beginner. It had to stop somewhere. And I think Aristotle was, was spot on with this. And the Old Testament, as attested to by the Lutheran Confessions had this the lutheran confessions had this 500 years ago and holy scripture had this many centuries beforehand in fact several millennia beforehand so here's here's what i think is really going on we'll talk about uh worldviews talk about presuppositions this this is where we start. We have to choose our presuppositions. And modern atheists ha have chosen a naturalistic, materialistic presupposition. They're going to explain everything from the notion that um, everything began in a, in a naturalistic way. They have to try to explain that. And quite honestly, it just becomes incoherent because of this infinite regress idea. It becomes incoherent because they say they rely on science, but science says that the universe had a beginning. That it's not infinite. That it's not eternal. See. And what's behind that? This That's my big question is why, why does it matter so much that um, the flying spaghetti monster doesn't work? By the way, the flying spaghetti monster doesn't work because the flying spaghetti monster is not omniscient, not omnipresent, not omnipotent. He, he is not the unmoved mover. If you want to call the unmoved mover the flying spaghetti god, the, the flying spaghetti monster, okay, fine. 
I guess. Why not just call it what all of human history has called it and call it God? Let's see. The, the flying spaghetti monster is not... Um, doesn't make philosophical sense. That's why atheists, new atheists in particular, are fairly for poor philosophers. Because they don't... They just say, oh, we can just throw any God in there and say, oh, he's, he's the one that created it. They say, oh, well, you people who believe in, in God are just God of the gaps people. Wherever we can't explain something, you just throw God in there. No, it's not just God that we're throwing in there. We're throwing in a being that has to have these qualities. It must be this whatever it is that initiated the universe has to have these qualities. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So the flying spaghetti monster doesn't fly. And the reason the flying spaghetti monster doesn't fly is because it, as articulated by the, uh, what is it again, Pastafarians, doesn't hold these qualities. And on top of that, if you think about that entire document, it's, it's all based on lies. They don't have any ancient documents documenting the flying spaghetti monster. It's just not there. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on here. And uh, try to bring this thing uh, more to a fine point. Well, along with purpose, the other, the other thing that correlates with it is the idea of value. Now, at this point, again, we might have a, a disagreement here. Because I do think that one of the important things about human life is that there are values which we don't invent. So that, that's a basic philosophical option I think that you say values are objective in the sense that some things really are worthwhile and of value even if nobody thinks they are mm. and that in thinking of a moral value you ought to be charitable for example that is true I think that's a more I think that's a moral truth and you can discover that it's true you ought to be charitable it's not something you decide or invent and um, so that that's another basic philosophical, it's an option really. But if you go for the option of there being objective values, that correlates with purposes because your purpose is to achieve something of value. So they go together, purpose and value. And I can't see that they would enter into any physical description of the brain or of anything else. And so in that sense, this, this value that you believe exists independently of um, you know, our brain states or anything else. I'm not, the word independently, I mean, it's obviously not, t uh, there is that co causal connection and... and uh, but it's objective, in, as you say. But it's, it's objective, it's, uh, I think, uh, I would believe, and I think, again, it's not decidable in, neutrally, but I would believe that uh, there are moral obligations on people, whether or not they think there are. And that is a truth about the universe. And does this can this only make sense in the con it, when we're talking about a a personal identity, the idea that we are a, a person who has a well, yes, it exists would, it's through not, time and it, is is not in a sense just a a value is not part of, the, of a physical catalog of right. things, and it correlates with a purpose. Your purpose is to obtain something of value, so that correlates with agency, and that correlates with the idea of a subject self which is other than just a stream of experiences, which was actually aimed to produce values. All those things connect mm. together. I think this will take us into the whole area as well of determinism and free will and so well, on. Well, can but, I just but, respond, but though, to, to, respond. to Keith's yes, uh, line about purpose? Um, what, what he's adopting is, uh, I think, quite clearly a sort of top-down theory of purpose. He doesn't think it can bubble up from purposeless processes the way Darwin and, and uh, people who are Darwinians like me would say. And, and he says he doesn't see how uh, this future-looking purpose could ever be accounted for in terms of the, something like the Darwinian purpose, uh, the Darwinian process. Um, uh, you should learn about Bayesian predictive coding. It's the big bandwagon in uh, cognitive neuroscience right now, which is precisely how the brain is always always anticipating, projecting, forming hypotheses in effect about what's going to happen next, and then checking those hypotheses against the data coming in. This is how our brains 
get the adroitness and the real-time capacity that they do. They're always, they're designed to look ahead. They're designed by Darwinian processes to anticipate the future based on the experience of the past. And since the future isn't always just like the past, they make mistakes. But they are also designed for those very mistakes to feed back into the system and correct those mistakes. So the brain operates as a generator of anticipations which are then tested against the world, which and it's a constantly uh, uh, revising uh, sort of a moving target about trying to get trying to get the immediate future right. And then of course that in turn permits us to, to have long range goals in the future. Another right. So what Dennett essentially is talking about here is natural natural revelation. So we learn from experience. And I, I think he's absolutely right. He is absolutely right. We learn from experience. We like, oh, that that was didn't have a good outcome. This caused pain to people, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we learn from that and then we move forward and then we you know we make mistakes and so on and so forth. Here here are the problems with this. Is first of all Again, as I said in the outset, why does Dennett get to say what was a mistake and what wasn't? I say telling people that engaging in homosexual behavior is a mistake. I say that uh, terminating, uh, killing babies before they're born is a mistake. Why does he get to say that's not a mistake and along with Dawkins say that people engaging in homosexual behavior is is a good thing? Why do they have that authority? Who gets to say? So there's the authority problem. On top of that, there's the time problem. So we have to learn from our mistakes. See, again, I have a doctorate in the school of hard knocks. You don't want to learn from the school of hard knocks. <laughs> um, natural morality takes a long time. And in the estimation of evolutionists, millions of years. Revelatory morality is instant. God says, don't do this. You may not understand why you shouldn't be doing this. But trust me, don't do this. You may not, you may not get it right away, but don't do this. After a while, you may be able to figure it out. But for right now, just don't do it. All right. So natural revelation is, takes a long time. Um, a word from God is instant. Finally, the, the the scope is lacking here. I don't I don't think we can ever come to a full bodied morality. And in fact, in our modern day and time, in our modern culture, we've regressed from morality. We may have riches and glory and live longer, but in a lot of ways we've regressed from morality because we don't understand the scope of it. We don't understand the breadth of it. Revelatory morality is complete. What God teaches us in Holy Scripture is the complete picture. Natural morality is limited, always limited to our knowledge. Okay? That's the idea there. This is not an elitist issue. This is a quality of life issue. You want to tell people that their concern and their desire for clean air and clean water is elitist? Tell that to the kids in the South Bronx, which are suffering from the highest rates of childhood asthma in the country. Tell that to the families in Flint, whose kids have their blood is ascending in, in lead levels. Their brains are damaged for the rest of their lives. Call them elitist. Tell, you're telling them that those kids are trying to get on a plane to Davos? People are dying. They are dying. And the response across the other side of the aisle is to introduce an amendment five minutes before a hearing and a markup. This is serious. This should not be a partisan issue. This is about our constituents and all of our lives. Iowa, Nebraska, broad swaths, swaths of the Midwest are drowning right now underwater. Farms, towns that will never be recovered and never come back. And we're here and, and people are more concerned about helping oil companies than helping their own families. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is about our lives. This is about American lives. And it should not be partisan. 
Science should not be partisan. This, we are facing a national crisis. And if we do not ascend to that crisis, if we do not ascend to the, to, to the levels in which we were threatened at the Great Depression, when we were threatened in World War II, if we do not ascend to those levels, if we tell the American public that we are more willing to invest and bail out big banks than we are willing to invest in our farmers and our urban families, then I don't know what we're here doing. I don't know what we're here doing. That the government knew that climate change was real starting as far back as 1989 when NASA was reporting this. And the private sector knew way back in the 1970s. So we had until around the time I was born to address this issue. I wish it didn't have to cost so much, but I'm gonna turn 30 this year, and for the entire 30 years of my lifetime, we did not make substantial investments to prepare our entire country for what we knew was coming. So now it's coming all up at the end. It's like when we live our whole lives, and we don't eat healthily, and we don't move, and, and we pursue unhealthy activities, and then at the end of our lives, our health care costs are very high. We have the choice to lower the cost now, because I can tell you the cost of pursuing a Green New Deal will be far less than the cost of not passing it. I will be damned if the same politicians who refused to act then are going to try to come back today and say we need a middle of the, the middle of the road approach to save our lives. That is too much for me. So, I would be hard-pressed to find another fundamentalist preacher who preaches with that kind of fervor and, uh, um, dare I say, eloquence even? Even eloquence without knowledge. This is what I found about fundamentalist preachers. The reason I bring out AOC here is because that's my point in all of this is that this is another version of fundamentalism just has different rules that's re that's really the extent of it it's a fundamentalism that has different rules now whether you whether you're concerned about climate change not concerned about climate change that's kind of AOC's big thing i'm not going to address that here but the real question is who has the authority who are we going to say here take the authority over all of humankind and run with it it's it's at the end of the day what we're talking about is authoritarianism now this is the political part of it when we don't have an outside source of authority for us people for us men, when we don't have, if we don't have God's voice, and you've heard me say this many times, when we don't have God's voice, then we have to place that voice in the hands of others. And if you're worried about fundamentalism, friends, there is the best picture of it I can give to you. That is fundamentalism uh, par excellence. Richard Dawkins, same thing. Dan Dennett, eh, he's a little lighter on the authoritarian thing. He thinks we should, you know, religion is kind of part of human history and we should talk about it. But how we should proceed, how we should live, is placed when we don't have God's voice, when we don't have his law, when we don't have his gospel. Let's talk about that for a second. When we don't have God's, when we don't have the gospel that God is the one who's going to bring about the quote utopia, what do we do? What do we do? We attempt to replace that with our own ideas about utopia, and every instant of every instance of somebody trying to bring about utopia in human history has resulted in utter disaster and violence. That's what it's resulted in. And we would, when we don't, when we, and when we refuse to say that God is going to bring the utopia, 
when this outside voice is the one who's going to bring the utopia, when we refuse to say that, then voices like this come in just like fundamentalist preachers who say whatever it is they say about how long your hair should be, how um, how you should dress, etc., is no different than what AOC is saying here and about how we should con consume fossil fuels. It's no different than that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a drive toward bringing about utopia, which we cannot do. Nobody can do that but God. And when we don't have God, we don't have that extra nos. When we don't have his voice who says that, who says that I'm the one who's going to bring about salvation, then we seek about wandering about, groping about in the darkness to try to bring about our own utopia. And that has always ended in disaster. And so what AOC is preaching here is going to end in disaster. What fundamentalist Christian preachers preach is going to end in disaster. Because you cannot bring about your own utopia. God is going to bring about the utopia. Now, does that mean we sit around and just wait for God to bring about heaven? No, absolutely does not. God, in, God through Christ, invites us to live in the eternity that it is to come right now. That's the idea. That's why we follow his laws. That's why we, we recognize that in the new heavens and the new earth. This is how we'll live. In love and care and concern for our neighbors and worship of God. We can't bring that about on our own, but we on our own, but we can individually live to follow God's commands and start to live in that in, in that eternity right now. And that's what the gospel gives us. We're not gonna, we're not going to make it perfect. We're not. And so um, that's that's really the idea I wanted to bring about here. It's really interesting. Um, kind of the, the memes that are going on here. On, on one side, you've got AOC. I mean, I could put, I could put up a, a, a video of AOC versus the most fundamentalist preacher, and you would, fi you would find the similar, similarities striking. Same thing with Dawkins. It's, 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 really, it's really astonishing. We need God's voice. That's the idea. We need God's voice. We need immediate revelation because we can't figure, out, we can't figure this stuff out all on our own. We can't figure this out through natural law completely, through natural revelation. can't be done. We need God's revelatory voice to us. Okay, got to go for this week. Thank you to Cain and A the Cross. Thank you to the Messed Up Church. And donate to the Kenya Well Project right now because you've listened to the podcast. You owe me five bucks, fifteen bucks, ten bucks, or a one-time donation of fifty bucks. See you next week.